Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Elon Eleven, and this is a comics podcast. This is a comics podcast where we are extra excited for new queer voices in comics, and I am joined by one today. My guest is Jude Doyle. Jude is the author of two books of nonfiction, Trainwreck, The Women We Love to Hate, Mock and Fear, and Why, and Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and the Fear of Female Power, which was named a Best Nonfiction Book of 2019 by Kirkus Reviews, and was shortlisted for Starburst Magazine's Brave New Words Award. Jude also founded the feminist blog Tiger Beatdown in 2008, led several successful social media awareness campaigns, and currently writes a weekly column at Medium. Ma is his first comic book. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. I am a big fan of your newsletter, and people should subscribe to it as this one goes. <laughs> and when I found out about a comic coming up, I was really excited because these are two things I love, like awesome people who write things and essays and criti- you know, queer theory and political stuff, and then comics, what? So for our listeners who are not familiar, Ma number one uh, is just coming out right now. Uh, Ma is a new series. What happens when one woman becomes the real monster society has always made her out to be, dragged by her sister Wendy to a feminist retreat on the remote island of an... I'm sorry, say the name again. Angisha. Angisha. Marion Angela Weber hopes to gain some perspective and empowerment that isn't at the bottom of a bottle. But everything is horribly derailed after an assault on her first night there. The violent encounter awakens something in Marion she never imagined, triggering warped mutations in her body and awakening a hunger she can't bring herself to name. When the townsfolk react with suspicion and violence, what unforgivable act will transform Marion into the very monster they've made her out to be? A provocative five-issue horror series from Jude Allison S. Doyle and artist A.L. Kaplan, a who folks may know from Full Spectrum Therapy, uh, that explores the anger of women trapped by society's expectations and the reclamation of power through collective rage. Perfect for readers of Redlands and Something is Killing the Children, and it's out from Boom Comics. So um, I'd love to know, like, how how did you, uh, how did this comic come to be? Uh, I had just finished writing Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers which was my uh, book on sort of horror and reproductive rights. And it was this very weird book about female monstrosity that I think I sort of, I got really deeply into it because I had just been, just become a parent rather. And I was dealing with weird issues around my body as the result of like what becoming a parent meant to me. And I was Mm. at the very beginning of my transition. I didn't know that yet, but (laughs) I was, I was about to have a pretty major uh, set of realizations. Um, And I was just finishing that up. I just sort of sent the last uh, draft back to Melville house when uh, boom approached me and they knew that I wrote, a newsletter on horror and that I had a book on horror coming out and they pretty reasonably pointed out that I had spent a lot of time analyzing the genre. They wondered if I actually had any stories to pitch. And I felt like that's so cool. Yeah, it really was because, you know, like I spend a lot of time telling other people what they've done wrong. And now the world has that chance with me, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. As a critic, I definitely relate to um, wondering what it would be like to get feedback in those ways. But for the record, I mean, not for the record, for listeners who are unaware, as critics, we get tons of people's opinions on our work constantly, too. So (laughs) (laughs) although um, I uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about that as well. But that's so cool that they were like reading the newsletter and were like, I bet Jude has ideas. And then you did. So this sort of developed out of out of working on that other book. I uh, so like comics wise, um, like tell me a little bit more about your history with the medium as a as a fan and absolutely. I mean, I think like every weird little queer kid has an X Men fixation. For me, it was Generation X, which dates me. I was Mm. like a nineties Chris Bacalo, you know. I'm like, okay, I think you're five years younger than me. And <laughs> like, I can pinpoint it. Um, exactly. Um, and as I 
grew up, you know, I sort of, I grew to understand it as a medium in which really important work was being done. I obviously, I wrote a lot of comic scripts in college. I did. I, I wrote a lot of comic scripts at one point in my life and it felt like, you know, I was really excited by the way the medium told stories. It kicked my brain into a different gear thinking visually and in terms of those still images. It's really great for horror because so much of horror, if you think of like, you know, anything that you've read or watched that scared you, odds are that those frozen moments are really a lot of what it's about. That moment where something kicks in on a primal level. But I didn't feel like I had the connections. I didn't feel at that point in my life that I looked like what Mm -hmm. the world told me a a writer of comic books looked like. Um, And I felt like, you know, it's the same thing that a lot of, you know, gender marginalized people or otherwise marginalized people get turned away from these communities with intense fandoms, not because they don't belong there, but because that's sort of the impression that you might not belong there, that you might not be welcomed there is so overwhelming. So I sort of like had a little hidden ambition that I buried and became very bitter about. And then when I was, you know, in my in my 30s, someone just said, well, do you think that you've ever considered writing a comic book? And I was just like, I have. (laughs) Oh, God. I got so intense about it. I was just like, this is the only thing I'm focusing on. I'm going to make this pitch work. It is going to happen. So, wow. Like a lot of things you've written, this is disturbingly relatable. Please continue. Yeah. <laughs> it, so it, uh, yeah, I'm really, really psyched that I got to do this and that I got to do it with Boom and that I got to do, to do it with Alan. Like, I mean, it's just as a press, they just are so overwhelmingly good at what they do. And the idea of belonging on that roster is just like, it's a, it's a huge, huge honor. So, yeah, I mean, it's exciting, like, to see these sort of worlds coming together, and um, I, I, I think it's a really great pairing with with you and and your artist. Um, you know, I, I, what is it like working with someone who's like transferring your ideas into like panels and turning your script into something physical to to read? I really appreciated that. I mean, I think from the beginning, I knew that as much as like I had like written little comic scripts in my room or, you know, when I was sort of trying to get on the level of the actual professionals I was working with, I was like actually drawing a lot of comics, you know, just in my spare time to make sure that my brain was thinking in terms of panels and page layouts. Um, Mm -hmm. But I tried to keep a certain level of humility about it. I know that this is a craft that people work on for their whole lives. It's sort of, it's like horror or like when I wrote my first book, train wreck, there was a whole section on Billy holiday and that meant I had to write about jazz music that people who really love these art forms that kind of get denigrated or pushed to the side or demeaned, they tend to have a really ferocious, formidable understanding of that form. And you need to, if you cannot match that level of understanding, you need to show humility before it. Like somebody Mm. who really writes about Billie Holiday, really writes about her, not just the way I do, can name every take of one song on Lady in Satin and tell you what's different about it. And some of those differences won't even be ones that you yourself hear. Right. And, you know, comics people have that same, like, very strong formal knowledge. Um, it sounds like I'm digressing, but I swear I'm not trying. No, to no, because... I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I tried to bring as much of myself to Ma as I could. I wrote every page, I storyboarded every page, and I was pretty specific, you know, and many pages do look more or less like here's what I had in mind. But Alan, in terms of the way he, uses the page the way he can use just space or knock a panel off alignment or move the focus a little bit off of where you would be expecting to focus your eyes in that scene he's such a master at just creating form and mood and using those choices to reinforce the politics of the story 
there is violence, you know, um, there's a rape scene in the first issue. And it's not a rape scene because you don't see a sexual assault happen in front of you, but you understand that a sexual assault has taken place. And mm -hmm. the visual language of how we present sexual violence in media is such a thorny, problematic subject. Because when you're looking at somebody's body from the outside getting assaulted, there's almost no way to do that without objectifying them, without making the violence committed against them like a gore scene or a special effect, something that like a horror fan would show up to see. That can't be what we're doing in Ma because it's a story about trauma. It is not a story about rape as much as it is a story about rape culture and about the burden of carrying something terrible that has happened to you in a culture where so many people are just totally fucking indifferent to it. Um, and having someone like Alan on that scene or on any of the other scenes of violence that might entail women, you know, later in the series, he was always so smart about like, how do we present this person's body and their life and their suffering in a way that fully humanizes them, that makes sure we are not looking at another person's pain as a spectator, that we're not gawking at it, that we are creating a space to honor it, putting you in that person's perspective rather than watching them from outside. I, I just couldn't have mm -hmm. asked for a better collaborator. He's so, so fucking smart about what he does. And his work is just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, for real. I mean, you, you hit on something that I've been thinking a lot in terms of the conversations happening now around horror, which is like, there's this idea some people have that if you're critical of the way sexual assault or something else really violent is portrayed in a piece of media that means that you're against portraying it at all, which is a remarkably ridiculous leap to make. Um, for You know, you're like, I'm not saying you can't do this ever. I'm saying the way this was done here was bad. And here's why. Um, or that you're trying to say that everything needs to have the same exact standards of how you have how it's presented or covered, um, which seems to be like really uh, jumping to the most extreme possible interpretation of something a critic is saying. Yeah. And I mean, I think that this is, you know, it's something that happens a lot in horror. It's a very silly argument that everything needs to be either Steven Universe or I spit on your grave. <laughs> like there's, you. there's just no, there's no room in between. But, you know, every piece of art has to make its own distinct choices. And I don't think it's wrong to say that a lot of people have used, let's say sexual assault in a lazy way, mm -hmm. right? It's not that it's, that it should never be talked about. It's that not enough thought was given to specific choices. And therefore it feels like it just got thrown in there to be shocking. I've complained a lot about mm -hmm. Game of Thrones for this because it just got to the point in that show where it felt like, well, the plot is dragging. Can we rape somebody? You know, like that <laughs> kind of thing. And that just, to me, that doesn't do what really great horror does, which is to dredge up ugly emotions. Like horror should not steer away from rape. Horror is one of our great tools for talking about rape. Horror is one of our great tools for talking about any form of gender marginalization. I mean, think about Shirley Jackson. Think about the yellow wallpaper, for fuck's sake. We've, we've mm -hmm. always put deep and harsh and upsetting experiences in horror because that's what the genre is for. It's supposed to bring up all of your hard emotions, and allow you to purge them and allow you to have catharsis. To me this sort of reductive thing where it's like you need to be okay with something being heavy, heavy finger quotes, extreme, you know, that's almost like you're treating it like a sporting event. It's like, well, how mm. much can you take? You know, it's, it's turning it into a chance to show off, which mm. I don't mind. Like when I was 12 years old and I watched event horizon, it was a very big deal to me that like, I did not get freaked out by people vomiting at their organs or ripping their eyeballs out. Like that's, that can be fun, but it, it shouldn't be the only approach you take. I mm. think it's okay to say that like, you know, mob, again, is about rape. It's about 
sexual assault. It's about, on some level, living in a body that's deeply uncomfortable to you. It is about so many, there are so many forms of gender violence that, that get invoked in it. And I understand, you know, I try to honor the fact that I am walking into this because I want to tell you what my experience has been like with trauma. I want to tell you how hard it is to live in a body that's just accumulated all these assaults over the years and, you know, what my anger feels like to me and what my fear is. Maybe that if I if I were to ever really embody everything that's been done to me, I would be the worst person in the room. You know, I want that to be something that we can talk about and that you can maybe come to Ma and have your own monsters dredged up. But I'm making a contract with you as a reader, right? That I respect mm-hmm. you, that I'm not going to just throw in, you know, like the goriest, grisliest rape scene I can just because I feel like the plot is dragging or because I want to impress you with how gross I can be. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's not that that stuff can't be talked about. It's that when you talk about it, you are on sacred ground. You are engaging with the reader. You have to have at least some awareness that this is not just your worst day, but maybe their worst day too, that you're both talking about. And I think it's fair game to talk about when something like, you know, to take this to a different level, something like, trans bodies in horror that's like a whole conversation there's silence of the lambs there's psycho there's sleepaway camp there are so many histories of just like trans or gender inappropriate bodies being used as scare tactics in horror but Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they can't be in there it's again it's where where is your sympathy in that scene how are you using the idea of let's say dysphoria, because certainly my dysphoria went a little bit into, you know, the Marion's weird relationship with her body. How are you using it? You know, not just can you use it? You obviously can. And people can just Mm -hmm. like, you know, I can complain about Game of Thrones till the end of my life. And it still made a zillion dollars and ran for 10 years and whatever, you know, but yeah, you didn't stop like, I, I, you know, I read your essay, I watched Game of Thrones, I continued to read it, at, watch it afterwards, I thought it was interesting essay that I didn't agree with, and it didn't keep me from watching Game of Thrones, it didn't cancel Game of Thrones, it wasn't like, <laughs> you know, and it also, I also wasn't like, oh, I have to apologize for watching Game of Thrones, because now I'm a bad feminist, it was like one one more, you know, piece of critical analysis. And then of course, by the end of the show, I was certainly like, I am so tired of this guys. Uh, You know, and I think (laughs) like as someone who enjoyed the books, like, you know, I I was inclined to be more patient with like waiting for, you know what I mean? Like you give something more Mm -hmm. of a a longer benefit of a doubt too. But um, like, even though I, I wasn't like on the same page with the review when the time it came out i was like the response to this is just really unhinged guys so yeah uh, yeah i feel like we have these sort of circular conversations about art like a few years ago we were having this conversation in comedy like can you tell a rape joke and like yeah you can tell a rape joke wanda sykes has told rape jokes tig notaro Mm -hmm. has told rape jokes Mm -hmm. you can tell a rape joke we get to criticize which rape joke you're telling you know yeah like yeah yeah. That's the thing is that like I love horror precisely because it's so good at talking about stuff that you know we're just not supposed to talk about. We're not supposed to mm-hmm. bring up. It's intimate and weird and it has bodies and fluid and death and weird sex just sort of packed into it. It always has, you know, Dracula's a real gay book. Um <laughs> but <laughs> you know like it's it's supposed to be taboo it's supposed to be bringing up the taboo but once you've brought up all that gunk and muck from the bottom of your psyche what are you doing with it you can do whatever you want but i have the choice to like you know i i have the choice to engage or not engage and hopefully you know that's what ma does hopefully ma is like a little circle where we can summon these demons and and purge them in a useful way rather than just like you know pelting you with terrible things happening to women all the time well one of the things that i think is exciting about it is there's so few pieces of body horror that have had a mass audience like i'm sure there's a million like books but that i've never heard of them pieces of horror that have a mass audience that are talking about pregnancy from the perspective of people who've been pregnant 
is like, <laughs> you know, certainly like as a person who really doesn't want to ever be pregnant, I relate to like, I'm perfectly, there's tons of work made by like cis men about pregnancy as body horror where I'm like, yeah, I, I'm there right with you, even though like I've dealt with stuff that you'll never deal with, David Cronenberg. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I think it's exciting that like to have something about that from someone who's been there, you know? Yeah. And it's really like, I mean, I love Cronenberg. I think, you know, that is, it is the saddest thing that I watched Naked Lunch like 20 times my freshman year of college because it was that and Talented Mr. Ripley. Those were the two gayest movies I could find at the time. Mm. <laughs> and they're both like horror movies, but okay. Um, but I love Cronenberg and I love, you know, Alien is a really great representation of pregnancy. I, you know, speaking of problematic creators, some part of me being pregnant, like I fully got Rosemary's baby just like shoveling raw chicken livers into your mouth. You know, right. like, right. I think that pregnancy for me, it's it's hard to talk about now because it's like you're I'm inviting you to, like, look at my body in a weird way. But it was for someone who had spent a lot of my life really uh, dissociating by not caring for my body very much. I was definitely just like, well, I'm cool. I drink a lot and I smoke a lot and I don't sleep and I eat only greasy takeout and I'm going to like keel over dead by the time I'm 30. But you know, it's, I was, I was spending time outside of my body as a way to avoid dealing with it. Pregnancy puts you right in there. You are so medicalized all the time. You mm -hmm. are constantly thinking about all that Chris Deva abject stuff of like what's on the inside of my body what's on the outside of my body what am i allowing to touch my body what am i allowing to become part of my body um what's me what's not me you become like very late in the game it's this strange strange thing where you are literally two people at once and right after you've had the baby like people talk about how they somehow magically wake up at the exact moment their baby does which is a like an experience I've had you you have this weird thing where like somebody starts out as you and becomes not you and that experience of transformation of undergoing what honestly seems like a paranormal experience it seemed that way to me at least it's, I think it would be strange for anybody it was particularly strange for me because it was I was I was suddenly so deep in something that was coded really feminine and I tried really hard to appreciate and understand that experience as feminine at the time and I'm glad that I did because femininity is good and great and if it's what's comfortable for you then you should be there and I think it's wonderful for me I was you know I was out on the ocean in a little boat and I had no idea where I was um, but I think that, you know, talking about the capacity of the body to transform, what it feels like to have something that is not you in you all the time, you know, to, to understand that you are on a timeline and like by hook or by crook, either something's going to come out of you in a way that doesn't feel great or people are going to come in and cut it out of you. And that's also not going to feel great. That's what eventually happened to me. Um, it, it's such a powerful, weird experience. I would never, ever, ever wish it on anyone who didn't go into it wanting that. It is one of the extreme possibilities for a human body is, is the way I would yeah say that you know like it really is like you know you can climb a mountain you can I don't know what you can do that's as huge and weird and life-changing as pregnancy transition people say is the other thing so yeah. maybe that's what I was I just went from one right to the other but um it, it's it's never something that should happen to you without consent because it's a huge bodily violation it takes mm -hmm. you it makes you into two people and it makes you into a different person and it it is really really 
fucking scary and painful, even if you go into it deeply wanting it, you know? Mm. And I think that being able to enforce it on people, whether or not they want it, just like being able to enforce a gender identity on people, whether or not that's who they are, it's, it's, it's part of how patriarchy works is by bodily invasion and subjugation. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I feel like I'm not supposed to say this because I haven't been raped, but all of that sounds like rape, right? Like being pregnant when you don't want to be, uh, being forced to live in a gender that like is not where you are. Like that's, that's like completely rapey, right? As, as someone who has experienced sexual violence, yeah, I'd say that it's, it's sometimes hard to, to tease apart those threads, you know, like, I mean, and it was really, I think, hard for me for a long time to even get back into my body enough that I could like start to ask, well, what's going to be comfortable for you, you know, because I think having experienced some sexual violence early in life, and it really is, it's like a lot of social control that depends on on scaring you. I can recall feeling at certain moments in my life. And I guess this is, this is sort of a raw thing to say on a podcast and I'm going to try to say it tactfully like, well, I can either do what I really want to do. I can keep fighting and potentially get killed or I can find some way to get through the next five minutes by giving these people what they want. And that feeling is really scary because it takes your you away it takes away your ability if it's if it's happened to you enough or if it's happened to you often enough on a recurring basis on a daily basis where it's just like you know what I don't want to piss you off I don't want I don't want what happens when you get mad at me or when you label me as defiant um Mm -hmm. It's like the assailant, whether that be, you know, an unsupportive parent or uh, the sort of violence that kids experience when they're labeled as gender nonconforming by their peers or an abusive spouse or just, you know, the rapist that you have in the room with you at that point in time. It lets that person become you in a sense. You you know, from then on, you don't Mm -hmm. just have your voice in their head. You have their voice in your head telling you that if you do what you actually need to do, you're you're not going to be safe. Um, So they are all really, I think, deeply connected in that our oppressors want to take away the part of us that wants, take away the part of us that feels, take away the part of us that is and replace it with what they need. And I think that that's every, every piece of horror that I've written. Cause I wrote, you know, a, a few things, a few pitches and a few just short stories where I was trying to, to wrap my head around the form and see if I could actually do anything that was actually scary. That, that one core scare I'm realizing is like been part of everything I've written the idea of having your you taken away, having yourself taken away, becoming a vessel for other people's wants and needs. And it's something that you can experience from many angles, but it's never any less yeah. of a profound violation. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really powerful. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I thinking also about just like creating horror, you know, making it's easy to just sort of be like, look at here's these particular visual tropes. And that's something that in a comic you can, summon by having someone draw them right um that are scary and sort of like being in a horror milieu versus creating something where people have a physical response of fear when they're reading it when you're like you know whether it's a pulse pounding or like trying to look away but not look away um and that building that sort of tension is a lot harder than just being like I drew a monster, guys. Look at the monster. <laughs> or I, I just read a monster and somebody else drew the monster. Um, like, h- how did you, you know, work towards, like, building the actual feeling of fear in, in, in the comic as you created it? Again, I think that, like, just the pacing of the comic and the way that it does so much of its work visually, like, ultimately what I'm doing is I'm just creating a scaffolding for Alan to bring literally everything to life it's very sad that you're talking to me (laughs) but um it's i think that writing a 
comic book. This is another one of like, we're going to go back in time to Jude's failed endeavors. But I was a poetry major in college, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like writing a poem or a sonnet where you have to be like so, so strict about the amount of words in a panel. I had a no more than 25 rule um, and the amount of panels on a page. And it's like writing something like a poem where it's the pacing and the rhythm and the formal aspects of it are doing most of the work. You cannot do what I like to do and what I've done many times in this interview, which is go on a long rambling rant where you try to convince the other person of your point of view. You have to live in the slowly building rhythm of it. And for me, that is where I was able to make it scarier. I was thinking a lot about um, 70s horror when I made this, mm -hmm. for some reason, um, the the sexual politics of something like The Brood, speaking of Cronenberg, or like um, Picnic at Hanging Rock or The Wicker Man, you know, yeah. those both yes. really, really <laughs> like part of it. Um, and it's so like, if you look at Picnic at Hanging Rock, which I thought about a lot for the for the at least the tone of it. It's just like there's so many weird little dreamy images that just hang out and take up space in your psyche. I can think about so many things that happen in that movie that it's just like somebody cuts a cake and it, it bothers me. It bothers me that the cake gets cut the way it does. <laughs> somebody falls I, down in front yeah. of a rock. It's terrifying, you know? <laughs> so like working in that way, like letting images be off kilter and letting them just hang there and, you know, that sort of dream pace that you get, that, that to me is, is unnerving. And it sets you up for, I won't say that there's no gore. There's gore. There's there's some splattery stuff yeah. that happens in the later issues. But just like that Lynchian picnic at Hanging Rock thing of just like hanging in space, waiting for something to happen has always been the most unnerving thing for me. And comics lend themselves really easily to that feeling. Well, I well, thank you for bringing up Picnic uh, Pic at Hanging Rock because that's actually been on my list of stuff I need to watch. And now I've officially added it to my watch list. So that was helpful. I am... I, um, Folks may have heard. I, Wicker Man is like one of my absolute favorite movies. So, uh, and you know, folk horror is really a bit of an obsession. And I, I think it's it's really cool, like the setting that you that you're creating of this like very '70s retro women's retreat, which is a thing that still exists, right? Like, just because this is very '70s doesn't mean it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about your conception of the retreat they go to and. Um, you know, the panels, for example, where you guys have reveal like the woman who's, you know, she's not the, the person who's like the visionary behind the retreat, but she's a woman who's actually like running things. It's like mm -hmm. such a, a really cool sequence. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a story that I've told a few times, but um, when I was, you know, maybe 12 or 13, I got really into like, I read about Riot Girl in Newsweek and I saw, you know, um, I saw the Oprah that had a riot girl on it and i was like <laughs> well i need i need to know more but i could not in you know columbus ohio in the early 90s you're you could not buy the riot girl material and i tried to learn about feminism and all i could get were these crusty old like paperbacks on feminist witchcraft from my food co-op so I spent like a lot of my tween years being convinced that this is literally like what feminism was, that you just moved out to a farm and worshiped eldritch deities. And that's what you did. And I don't like, so I had this very romanticized image of like what women's empowerment looked like. And it was 100% about like worshiping the moon and like, bathing in the ocean i love that sequence now and i love it more because after alan had drawn it the lord video came out <laughs> where it's just women oh. dancing in the surf so it looks more like a lord video now to me than like the wicker man but it's it's definitely like that vision is really hazy and romantic and and beautiful to me this this sort of image of just like we're going to entirely detached from patriarchy to the point that we no longer even believe the universe works in the same way that patriarchy does. We're going to find something that's so old it comes from the fucking Stone Age. We're going to be at one with the ocean and probably know a lot about how herbs work 
and you know <laughs> have like ancient labyrinths that we do torchlit dances and that's amazing to me and it's also really dangerous because that specific movement the women's spirituality movement was and is to this day really heavily colonized by turfs you know it right. um this idea of like a natural woman's body, you know, like worshiping the goddess, no men allowed. Like that's absolutely, it sounds beautiful to me, but in practice, it's very often it's mishfest. It's very often like just an excuse to be super violent and exclusionary towards trans women. And that's not what's happening in Ma. In Ma, uh, Miranda, the woman we meet on the beach who is actually running everything, you know, she's trans. There are trans women in that scene. Um, but it's, it's not a turf commune, but I love the idea of this, like, we're going to retreat away from the world and find our ancient stone age deities and create this whole other culture. I, I found such beauty in it. And I also find such violence in, in that, that, um, it seemed like a really good premise for, a horror movie it seemed like a really good premise for a horror comic it seemed like that you know sort of combination of finding your own beautiful world and just like straight up rage at the outsider is is really potent i think that the commune in ma is really drawn from my sort of tween age fascination with the women's spirituality movement and I say that knowing that that movement has in and of itself sort of a built-in darkness to it. There's always been this strange overlap, actually, between um, radical communities and alternative spiritualities. Um, there's like a bit that's just like a line of dialogue and issue, too, about how someone was both a socialist and a spiritualist. And that's actually from a book called Occult America. It really was the case that a lot of socialists were just like heavily involved also in seances, you know? And um, if you look at 70s feminism, a lot mm -hmm. of those ladies went off and did witchcraft and worshiped the moon. And there's this sort of innate tendency among radical people, I think, to sort of start with how could the world be better and then to understand that like our mythology is how we create the world. So you, you wind up on these spiritual quests to like find a God that can support your vision for what the world should be. And that definitely seems like in a horror comic, <laughs> people, you know, who go off and start communes and try to find their own gods, like typically aren't that well intentioned. And the fact that the, um, the women's spirituality movement, even though this is specifically not a turf commune, even though I have actually uh, interviewed women from that movement, like um, Starhawk, and she's not a turf and she rebukes. Oh, turfs. wow. Yeah. Yep, yep. Like she absolutely, I talked to her about it. I was like, look, a lot of this imagery now is used by separatists and trans exclusionary feminists to be like the sacred vagina, the sacred womb. It's all, you know, it's, that's what being a woman is. And that's what's being, that's what sacredness, you know, comes from. That's where women's sacredness arises from. And she was just like, look, back in the day, we thought those bodies were heavily stigmatized. We did not mean to go and stigmatize a different set of bodies. That's not what it was about. And that's not what it should be about. And she definitely That's a her later wonderful life. way to put it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. But just the fact that these women's spirituality communes, not only do they have that weird wicker man quality of just like, you've just gone back in time several centuries because you're, you know, you're Michael Sheen in Apostle. You've repudiated the modern world. Um, they also like, if you are, trans inclusive or trans as a reader you will notice that like some of the imagery like the labyrinth and the labyrinth and um you know just the sort of bitter distrust of the world of men and you know just every time these ladies say the word men it's like a cuss word 
I, it, it does remind you, even though it's not a turf commune, of the ways in which feminist ideology has historically created room for that darkness, drawn mm-hmm. certain people with that darkness in them and allowed, you know, something very scary in them to flourish. I don't think that that's like what feminism is. I think that that's a perversion and a desecration of feminism in some ways, but um, the double-edged quality of it, that this is at once like this really weirdly utopian place where like everybody's in their, you know, their white dresses and they're just in the sea being bathed and born again and calling each other goddesses. And, you know, they're absolutely allowed to process their trauma day and night and be supported And it feels like everything you would want in a way, but it's also just like if you're watching this or reading this with any consciousness of feminist history, you're like, okay, so like, why does this feel like Mary Daly? (laughs) This, this feels like it's headed somewhere bad. I like that. I like that there's like a level of sinister implication to it that gets deeper the more you actually are familiar with the history of, of feminism in the 20th century. Yeah, definitely. I I'm I'm really love that it's going there because people need to talk about that. We're sort of at this weird moment where like folks who have been involved in feminism at a certain level from a certain generation, like basically our age and older, like turf meant one thing to us, and now it means like literally everyone who hates trans people exactly. and it's sort of interesting because you are sort of looking back at like yeah but we know i guess i should like for listeners who didn't grow up reading about the lesbian sex wars and the women's michigan <laughs> women's michigan <laughs> festival like turf used to be specifically women who thought of themselves as feminists they're yeah. wrong but they were coming from an ideology that they viewed as being feminist and that was discussed as being such whereas now you literally have like women who have no connection whatsoever to any kind of feminist thought um and it's interesting because like i think there's something useful in having language to identify people who claim to be feminist but actually truly aren't versus like i don't know right-wing christian haters like in terms of like the ways in which they operate in their ideology. But, you know, I don't know. I guess I've always been someone who likes the precision of language. And, and the fact that they hate, the fact that they, so, you know, since they hate being called TERFs, let's keep calling them that. Like, whatever, you know, like, they're, <laughs> like, they're the worst. And if they hate being called that, I will keep calling them that to make a point that they're the worst. But it is sort of interesting because you are looking specifically at a segment of lesbian separatism, that was very strong at the seventies and eighties and that kind of fell out of favor and still has, but it's still like you see stuff going around and like getting its claws into like young people sometimes still too, even though it's not the dominant strain of radical feminism today, you know? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, Kai Shevers has written and spoken about this. There are circle circles that sort of bill themselves as being radical feminist and they are for detransitioners and it's for young trans masculine mm. people it's the idea that like oh you've done this because you hate yourself let's let's cure you with feminism um these ideologies are really still around uh, i think megan murphy used to really claim to speak for dworkin in some senses but dworkin herself yeah. was not turf i think that you know I don't want to just dunk on this part of history because again, like I think that drawing from these, you know, really goofy eco-feminist, feminist witchcraft, women's spirituality books that I was super into as a teen, like um, it, I want you to see what's beautiful about it. And I want you to be able to engage with, like, what's the difference between Andrea Dworkin and, you know, Janice Raymond. I want you to understand Hmm. the difference between, like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Modern day TERFs are 100% committed to essentially just to patriarchy. They are committed to traditional gender roles. In the UK, there's a lot of stuff coming out of mom's net. There's the idea that motherhood is this 
very particular female role that, you know, trans women or trans men are somehow infringing on. They want everybody to be gender normative in how they present, even if they say they don't. And it's just like at this point, calling them TERFs doesn't really make a ton of sense because it's just the anti-trans movement. And it's about, yeah. you know, biological determinism and traditional gender roles and all of that. Um, but the extent to which like 70s feminism, it usually, if you hear someone under 30 talk about it in particular, if they say the word second wave, nothing good is going to come after. Come after I those know. Fears. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's, it's fair because it was a movement with significant failings as all movements are, but I want mm-hmm. you to be able to go back in and find out where these people were coming from and what is, you know, righteous in that rage. They were often, you know, very specific about, um, about where their rage was coming from and who it was directed at. It was often very much for, for the more radical ones was it was directed at other people on the left for creating places where even the people who were working to make the world a better place didn't necessarily care that it was a better place for their wives and their girlfriends. I think that's something that we still have to look at, you know, Mm -hmm. in a world where, it's really easy for progressive spaces to slip into misogyny because we're used to blaming and hating women. You know, I think that we have a right to know this history. I always go back to, this is something um, a professor I actually kind of hated said to me uh, about Shakespeare. (laughs) He was like, well, everyone must read Shakespeare because he is relevant to us all. And I was like, well, what if I just want to say that this was written in you know, hundreds of years ago, and it has regressive messages about sex, and it has regressive messages about race. And it's just, it's not relevant to me, because I want to live in a world where we don't define people in those terms anymore. And he said, well, then it's especially relevant to you, because you are in conflict with it. If you want to critique something, if you want to make something better, if you want to move on from something, that's when it becomes particularly relevant to you and it becomes incumbent upon you to really know everything about it, you know, because in order to improve on, you know, I don't, I don't think that 18 year old me really thought he was going to improve on Shakespeare, but I would have at that age, I might've thought that I could have done something better. Um, But like, if you want, to build on something and make something better and heal the admittedly very cancerous tendencies towards biological essentialism and towards gender essentialism and towards separatism that, uh, that produce the turf movement. If you want that, then you need to be in a very intimate relationship with that thinking. And Ma is not going to like, I don't know. It's, it's definitely not a textbook, but it does come from my own sort of like entanglement with that, thinking there's a lot of thinkers that i just sort of like or respect you know like howie uh the guy who essentially drives a van and does nothing else with his life is seen reading books that i really like Ah, okay i was wondering about that yeah Mm -hmm. like it's uh he's he's got stuff that he you know he needs to do he needs to bone up he's like the only guy on the on the lady commune he needs to have his gender theory pretty correct or they're going to ax him to death but um it's there are a lot of thinkers that i like that sort of like run in in and out of this comic book even though it is just pulpy horror and hopefully you know once once we get to some body drops it'll you won't think that you're learning anything (laughs) but you know i but i have always argued that like comics specifically as a medium are particularly good at introducing people to be it music that they wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise film they wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise literature or like philosophy that they would not have been exposed to otherwise and like this is totally in that very how do we, shall we say vertigo comics, heavy tradition, frankly, like that. Yeah. Like you could come out of this being like, Oh, here's some reading that I might want to do. And like, that's good. You know, like I, I definitely learned about music from reading Sandman, you know, I, I, 
Yeah. I know people who like got into Shakespeare by reading Sandman, you know, like it's <laughs> like, right. Like yeah. it's um, it, it, having some of those breadcrumbs for people to pick up and, and having sort of the DNA of the story on the page is one of the things that comics do really well. Yeah, absolutely. And it really is like, I mean, it, it was freeing for me not only to move away from a text-based, you know, or text-focused form of communication towards something where I could work with images and work with another part of my brain. It was really freeing to just be knocked loose of <laughs> reality and, um, and to be able to just fantasize and tell the story in a way that is a little bit more allegorical. You know, that I think the character of Wendy is someone who can represent that sort of like very white bread, vanilla, heterosexual life of like motherhood and traditional gender roles. And she's very good at being traditionally gendered. And it was interesting for me to write that character because I wound up putting really weird, vulnerable parts of myself in her. I didn't, she was written to be the character that I had nothing in common with. And I think she's now the character that has the most of me in her. And, um, mm. you know, and to say like, well, what is it to be very good at these traditional gender roles? Is there violence that you can experience without experiencing much violence at all? My life has had, you know, it's, it's fair share. I would, you know, not that any share is fair, but it's, it's had violence in it. And I, can identify with a character like Diana who runs the commune or with Marion whose trauma is very much central to the narrative because these are characters who experience sexism not as an immaterial thing of being expected to fit a role but as like if you go to this place if you do this thing if you interact with this person you might die you know right right um or you won't die and other bad things will happen um I can, I can identify very strongly with that, you know, but I think that writing a comic gives you a space to just say, well, like, what would it be if these women's communes that you were so obsessed with as a teenager actually were kind of cool and they weren't mishfest? Like, you know, like, let's just have, <laughs> let's just have a trans lady leading it. Let's have, you know, like, let's have a trans inclusive women's commune. And what would it be like to just be on an island and do some fucking witchcraft about how angry you are at rape? I mean, that does sound like a good vacation in many ways. And it, you know, like just just to knock loose a little bit of the very specific settings of my life and to let these possibilities play out and sort of tangle up with each other through a more allegorical plot line. I think honestly, like Ma really fucked me up to write it. I was like getting a lot more mm. work done in therapy by the time I had written this book. I was just like, oh, I'm <laughs> not, I'm not well. This, this did not come out of a healthy person, did it? You know, <laughs> so it did at, at the very, at the bare minimum, having to like really engage with my like demonic sea monster tendencies has, has made me a lot a lot healthier just as a dude like I, I no longer have my sea monster hidden I know exactly what she's capable of yeah yeah I mean it sounds like you know I mean you do so many really important powerful essays you know about your own experience as well and so it's really helpful to have that thinking out there and shared with other people yeah um, and there's only and, so much you yeah. can do with an essay. I mean, I run into this all the yeah. time now that I'm talking about like gender and sex more that just like I, you know, you reach down into yourself to yank up a trauma and like everybody else's trauma comes out with it. You wind up being entangled in other lives and other stories. And I think that, you know, for whatever reason, just, just saying, well, none of this has to be true and working through fiction is, is maybe a way to be as honest as you possibly can be because there's nobody at risk except yourself, you know. Something you just said about the, the like, trans-inclusive commune made me, I had this fun flash. Have, have you ever read Doc and Fluff, The Dystopian Tale of a Girl and Her Biker by Patrick Califia? I haven't yet. I read a lot of Califia, like, in college, and he just right. seems so tough and cool that I imagined he would, like, kick sand in my face, but I, <laughs> I should read it. 
<laughs> um, well, it's it's good. It would it's I'm I would I'm I'm I think you'd be finding it interesting, and I think it would be good that you're reading it after you finished your your comic, you know. But like, it's um, there's definitely I I'm, I'm like, it's definitely in a different genre, but like there's definitely some shared interests in it, and it is sort of brought up. I was like, oh yeah, that is kind of like, if you like this, you'll like that, and if you like that, you'll like this probably. I think yeah. So. I will. And I haven't, I haven't really looked at that book since college myself. So, you know, I know that there's things about it that are like problematic in terms of depiction of uh, like the black characters, basically like yeah. they're, they're, they're positive stereotypes, but they're stereotypes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that, that's kind of been the main critique that I've heard people give like on it since it came out in 1990, but um, yeah, that's but, it's, but it's an interesting book. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's, you know, like, queers and like masculine uh butch identified women of various flavors like after the apocalypse in a biker gang like in the women's commune so yeah it's like what's not to like anyway but yeah i hadn't i haven't really there isn't that much other stuff that i've seen and especially in the comic space like i don't i haven't I haven't seen quite as much genre stuff in this, in this particular piece of it. There's definitely a lot of really amazing science fiction and, and, and horror work, but um, I I'm really intrigued by this particular setting. So yeah, I definitely encouraging folks <laughs> to dig in there. Um, one thing you said early that uh, I did want to come back to was how much you loved uh, reading generation X X men books when you were younger. Um, and, uh, you know, th- those characters are all having a big comeback moment in the yeah. Jonathan Hickman and co era X-Men that's happening now. Um, I, I myself have always been a big fan of Monet because I actually got into her through reading X Factor. Mm. But um, that like Peter David series, who we will not talk about right now on account of <laughs> all of his other shit, but also because I was just on Cerebrocast to talk specifically about Multiple Man. And that whole X Factor run was sort of the main topic of it. Folks should check out the interview. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, I, I made me thinking though, it's like, oh yeah, you like Gen X. And those were never the, the I was, that was not my X-Men book. Yeah. So I, I'd love to hear like what spoke to you about that particular series and like, what are, have you, have you revisited it since your youth at all? Okay. Or? I have, I have. Um, so I feel like, I have to admit that I liked like the dopiest one maybe, which was, I was really, I was into chamber and he is the Mm -hmm. most nineties X-Men in the world. It's literally like his thing is just that like he wears black jeans and he plays guitar and he was apparently like in a, in a Brit pop band. They're never clear on what kind of alternative rock he played, but that's like his right. ambition, but he can't kiss a girl. So he's sad. And I was like, no, this is cool. <laughs> this is because this the one. lower half of his face and chest <laughs> yeah. is missing and it's on fire. <laughs> It's just, I think I really related to that. Like I would, I would absolutely love to go on a date with you but they had that really weird premature ejaculation metaphor where it's like a girl tried to kiss him and his like volcano blew up the door no way (laughs) yeah it was such a weird it was so weirdly metaphorical in ways that like as a tween i was just barely able to get but i got it but um yeah, they had, it was a strange book. It was 90s X-Men. So, like, they had, you know, Angelo, who was, like, the tough Latino gang member who just dropped, like, random Spanish words into every sentence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. They had Singh, who was the perfect black man, who was the strongest and most peaceful of all the other characters. It was obviously the first to die. They just knocked him up. Yes. Like, <laughs> things got slow they <laughs> just brought him back and he's on the x-men team and everybody oh who everybody who's not like a gen x person is like who who, who, who? oh he <laughs> seems cool he's got a really cool outfit now but yeah, yeah like and everybody I, I was like why don't i know who he is and they're like because they killed him immediately because he was the black character who <laughs> was a nice guy him. like oh of course of course right away he was just doomed but well, like now he's on the main x-men team so there you yeah. go yeah 
And okay, so they brought back Angelo too, right? Because I remember I picked up one of those comics where it was like, oh, the return of skin. And I was like, oh, let's see what's up. And he got crucified. (laughs) (laughs) No. Well, everybody, nobody in the X-Men is dead anymore, except for clones of, except for clones. But that doesn't mean that the focus, because everybody, they're in the new order of the X-Men comics. Every, every mutant has a backup saved and they can be brought oh. back to life well, but um handy for people with this lifestyle yeah exactly <laughs> um and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and they're all living in like a post-scarcity economy on an island nation of mutants it's a uh, they're having a moment but skin i have not seen anything with him well, he's like I, he's, maybe, he's alive but i don't know okay well good i mean maybe- I hope he comes back and is really mad about just being crucified off screen. They didn't even mm-hmm. give him a death scene. They were just like, by the way, here he is. Um, but that's <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> uh, but okay. I'll redeem myself though, by saying that like the one character I still do really love to this day and people handle her well, and they handle her very poorly. I can recall some 2000s comics that handled her very poorly and they were unfortunately the ones with her name on the cover but emma frost man i'm still i'm mm. so into emma frost just as a yes video, she seems to me literally perfect you know well she is definitely one of the central characters of the current era and yeah. i suspect you would like how she's being written currently because i feel like we probably share critiques of the same things and it yeah. comes to the, some of the solo series but um i mean you've got to love like as much as I like I'm not a fan of Camille Paglia, you have to say that there's something to be said for a woman in a superhero comic quoting Camille Paglia <laughs> while wearing lingerie in like nineteen eighty eight or something. Like that's 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 a that's a look. Um yeah. but yeah, Emma Frost is the best. And um yeah. That was always the thing with her. Like I, I got really into her suit years because she was so often just like she was dangled as like fanboy bait. Like she was just mm-hmm. like a hot lady in a corset. But it was never like her thing was that she was fundamentally triumphing over patriarchy in that corset. Like she had made herself from nothing. She was like the neglected daughter. She was mousy and unappealing. And then she found that she had mind control powers and she could literally just make you do whatever she said. And she made the best of it. You know, she scraped Mm -hmm. herself together, built herself a life. The thing about her was never that she was hot. It was that she was very smart and had, for whatever reason, never internalized that sort of female prerogative to make oneself smaller and make oneself less of a problem for other people. I That's like, if you can get to like, angry smart emma frost in your writing that's the one where i really i lock in on her i love her it's great that she has a corset Mm -hmm. i believe that she's you know she's hot because she wants to be hot but it's never been her only thing you know right right yeah i mean image but like she's the character who will talk about she's like i am wearing this for a reason and i like everything she does is like a choice that she's making exactly about her own power She's and, and she's is strong, strongly like, considered. She's very third wave. Like that's the thing. Oh yeah. That, like you know, her thing is just like I've empowered myself through sexuality. Like great, but your solo comic still has like what's really clearly a Jenna Jameson shot that's been drawn. I know. Like, it's like <laughs> you're tracing porn that isn't even popular. Like that porn was stale at the time that was coming yeah. out. I, yeah. I was like, dude, your video collection is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> that was, that was really like, this is like really yeah. tacky, but um, yeah, no, it, they're giving her better outfits right now. Like actual, like people have consulted with fashion, but are still very in character. And she's like one of the, she's one of, she's like basically leading the team. And it's like one of like the top, like three people basically running stuff right now. So it's, it's a good Emma yeah. Frost era. Yeah. But yeah, you totally were right. I mean, and, and you had, you know, generation X was like the one where she and Sean Cassidy were running the team. So yeah. And was... nobody cares about Sean Cassidy. So <laughs> is he doing anything these days? He's back. Well, I mean, they just, what? they just, well, they, well, here's the thing. They gave him a cool outfit to wear for the, for the Hellfire Club gala. So now okay. people are really into him again, because if you draw somebody looking hot and wearing cute clothing, people are going to be like, who's that? 
That's um, fine. That's fine. So, I just, again, I remember yeah. him, like, he was like the Irish version of Angela, where, like, everything you said had to be like, mm-hmm. Huck and Begora. You know? Yeah, like, <laughs> it's very over the top. Um, <laughs> actually, there was, God, I forget which comic. Fuck. In one of the recent X-Men books, there's literally a, a joke where a character where he's yelling at someone on the phone being, he's like, well, why didn't you just call me? And the guy's like, everybody in my, everybody in my phone book is called Sean Cassidy, Sean. I didn't know which one was <laughs> calling me. And I had this like, oh, I love you. <laughs> so like at least somebody like winked at that point. He's like, but everybody I know is called Sean Cassidy, which yeah. is, you know, I live in New York. So fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I was really excited to make this happen. I really enjoyed issue one of the comic. Cannot wait to check out what's next. How many issues is the series going to be? It's going to be five. So in January, it'll wrap up. Gotcha. Do you have any other fiction or comic stuff that might be on the horizon for afterwards? I don't know. I don't. I'm really excited to see if this does well and if anybody wants me to do anything like it in the future. I mean, I love I love working on so much every day I wake up and it's you know I'm still getting you know images I I just got the line art for issue three and it's so gross looking and I I just I've I've so adored being able to do this I would love to do it again I don't know if I ever will but you know you can always hope well folks go buy the comic and support it and we'll get more and um you know I just love that like you like with trying to write comic scripts before like you know I think you know, like this is in your blood of like the stuff you've been wanting to do and it's great to see it happening. So uh, I, I hope well, so. I hope yeah. I can contribute something to the forum, you know. <laughs> and so t- tell our listeners, since you are uh, um, writing prolifically in your newsletter, which is not on Substack because Substack is fucking transphobic. Uh, uh, tell our readers where you can, where they can keep up with your work. Um, I'm on Ghost because I think a horror writer should be on Ghost, and it's jude-doyle.ghost.io. Um, and I am also on Twitter all the time. You'll think much less of me, and that's still, it's still Sadie Doyle, S-A-D-Y-D-O-Y-L-E. And you can find me at Medium uh, once a week, sometimes more, at judedoyle.medium.com. Yes, I really recommend folks get on your list because it's excellent. I've really appreciated your writing. And of course, I've been following you on Twitter forever. <laughs> As for me, I, relatably enough, I'm also on Twitter uh, uh, just really an ungodly amount of time at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. And this is Graphic Policy Radio. Uh, we'll be continuing to talk with comics artists, writers, and creators as well as my spinoff show, Deep Space Dive, where we dive into the politics and subtext of the most political Star Trek series, all here at Graphic Policy Radio. And as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.